Oh, we already started. Welcome to our talk, Load Value Injection. But before we start, there is something you should know about it. I specialize in a very specific type of security, micro-architectural security. You're talking about Meltdown. Not exactly. Well, also Meltdown, but before we dive into that, let's look at how processors work exactly. So a modern processor is like a beautiful building. You have different applications, virtual machines, operating systems, all executing on the same um, beautiful piece of engineering, but the processor takes care to insert these metaphorical walls in between. So that means that the memory is uh, of those different applications is properly isolated and that forms the basis of security, just like in architecture. So the architecture is nice, you but have you thought about the underlying microarchitecture, the foundations of your walls? Well, what do you mean exactly with that? I mean, this all looks uh, nice and easy, but then you have things like caches in there, things that are not even visible on your architectural level. So look at that simple snippet here, for example. I do very simple code here. I print one variable twice. And if I do that, then of course, the first time I haven't used it before, so it has to be gathered from the main memory. It will, won't be in the cache. But the second time I do that, there will already be a copy in this cache that you don't even see on your architectural level. And this makes it faster. So I can clearly see here that there's a difference when I get your value from the DRAM or if I get my copy from the cache. So you don't even see that on your architectural beautiful le uh, level. Yeah, so, so that's interesting, Michael. Can you do something wrong with that? Of course. So I didn't just tell you that because it's interesting. I did tell you that because you can actually mount attacks using that. So for example, look at this simple example we have here. We have an attacker application and we have a victim application. And they share some memory, like some shared memory from a, a library that you use in the system. And of course, we have a cache. And now the interesting thing about the caches is if some memory is cached by one application, it's also cached for the other application. That's a good thing for the shared memory here. And now what we can do as an attack is we flush something from the cache. We remove that shared memory from the cache so that we don't have a copy there anymore. And then we wait until it's the victim's turn. And the victim now might access the data or might not access the shared data. If the victim accesses the data, it will be again in the cache. That happens completely transparently. And now, as it's our turn as the attacker again, we can also access the data. It's shared data. And what we do is we measure the time while accessing the data. If this is fast, then we know that data comes from the cache and not from the main memory. And from that, we know that the victim actually accessed the data. And we can clearly see that as timing differences. So measuring that access time gives us clear timing differences. For example, here with this histogram, where we see if it's a cache hit, then most of our hits, the timings are around 60 cycles, something like that. But if it has to be fetched from main memory, that's a lot slower. And we are talking more about 220 plus cycles here, which we see in the red part. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. wait a minute, Michael. Did you just explain to me that by looking at the foundations, the micro architecture, you actually found a way to breach these architectural walls? That, that's quite cool, right? So you say that if you are clever enough, when you look at side effects in the CPU, these metaphorical walls are not so absolute and you can peek over them with side channels. That's quite exciting. Mr. Van Burg has an idea he would like to discuss with you. Spreading meltdown? Not exactly. Michael, I have a test for you. You're not gonna tell me anything about it first? Before I describe the project, I should know you can do it. Why? Well, it's not strictly speaking leaky. You have to explain it. Foreshadow to me. All right, let's see. So meltdown is a really interesting attack. You see, I already prepared a bit of code here, a simple line of code at the top where I access some kernel memory. And of course, we all know that this is not allowed. And if I would do that, there's a page fault and my application is killed. That's 
how it should be, how it's supposed to be, there's this permission check in the hardware that prevents a user space application from accessing the kernel. Now, what we do in Meltdown is that we exploit the out of order execution. So what happens here? We access this kernel address. We try to read the value. Of course, it will give us this exception, this page fault, but there's the out of order execution and transiently for a brief amount of time, we actually have that value, can work with that value before it's cleaned up by the CPU again. So what we do here is I prepared some memory, some user memory, and I access a part of that memory that depends on the value we read from the kernel. And that's exactly what I'm doing here in the second line of code. So I use here the value that I read from the kernel, although I already crashed architecturally, and use that to access the memory. This memory access will go through in this transient execution, and this part of the user memory will be cached afterwards. And then, if we have that, we can use our cache attacks, like flush and reload as shown before, to see what was actually accessed. And by seeing what was accessed, we can get the value that we read from the kernel, because that can directly be inferred from the part of the memory that was accessed. You'll have to do that. So yes, Meltdown is not one single attack. It's basically an entire class of attacks. And we can see that here in this huge tree, where we have all the known Meltdown attacks so far. And this also includes the foreshadow attack you asked me about. So this is also one type of this Meltdown attack. And all these attacks have a bit of different properties here. For example, the amount of control we have over the address we want to leak. So this data we want to leak. In Meltdown, as I explained before, we have seen we can specify the full virtual address we want to leak from. In our case in Meltdown, we specify the kernel address and then we leaked from this kernel address. There's also foreshadow you wanted me to explain. And there it's a bit the other way around. We don't specify the virtual address where we want to leak from, but we can specify the physical address where we want to leak from. So it's not limited anymore to our own address space. As long as we have a physical address, we can leak from that physical address. There are also other types of meltdown attacks, like a fallout, zombie load, or riddle, and they have even less control on which data to leak. So they basically only allow you to specify a page offset, so where on the page this data is located you want to leak, without knowing which page exactly, or for zombie load and riddle, only the offset inside a cache line, but you have no idea where on the page the cache line is, or which page that is, so you have no control over the virtual or physical address for leaking data with those attacks. And if we look at that in more detail in the microarchitecture, then it gets quite complicated how that actually works. So we have here our simplified, still simplified image of a microarchitecture, in this case a Skylake core that consists of the front end and the execution engine and the memory subsystem. And as we are leaking from memory, we are of course uh, interested in the memory subsystem. But we find the L1 data cache, the store buffer, the load buffer, the data DLB, the line fill buffer, and then further on the level two, level three caches and DRAM at some point. And with Meltdown and Foreshadow, we both leak from the level one cache. The difference is just we specify either the virtual or the physical address to leak from. With the other Meltdown type attacks like the microarchitectural data sampling attacks, it's this entire class, this group, where you, can, where you cannot control anything about the addresses where you want to leak from, you can leak from different buffers as well. You can leak from the store buffer, you can leak from the line fill buffer, and you can also leak from the load ports. So it's basically how the execution engine is connected to the memory subsystem. And for that, we also have these different attacks, like for example, the zombie load attacks. And they are also all Meltdown type attacks. More like it. Okay, so as a quick recap, Meltdown is a family of attacks who abuse that folding loads, CPU exceptions, can pick up completely unrelated data from completely unrelated addresses from a variety of microarchitectural buffers. That, that's really a, a main insight uh, developed over the past two years.
Okay, so if we look at what we have seen so far, we have this, this very nice square uh, with two axes. And on the, the horizontal axis is uh, a leakage axis versus an injection axis. And on the vertical axis, we see uh, the kind of microarchitectural structures we're looking at, you know, the branch prediction structures versus the heel data hierarchy. And the oldest attacks we have seen are in the top left of that square. So that means um, uh, branch prediction side channel attacks. Uh, and what we have seen now is an entirely new class of data leakage attacks that get data from the data uh, memory hierarchy on the bottom left meltdown. There's also this similar class of attacks many of you have heard of. It's called Spectre, and they essentially turned around prior uh, branch prediction leakage into branch prediction injection. And uh, I think we overlooked one square. And this last square, that's LVI. The idea of load value injection for LVI is quite simple. We turn Meltdown around. You bring the victim into a fault and then they fill it with their secrets. And you break it and leak it. Well, it's not strictly speaking leaking. After all, it's called load value injection. Load value injection, is it possible? Of course not. Well, if you can leak a value from a microarchitectural system, why can't you plant a value there instead? Okay, let me plant a value in a microarchitectural buffer. Let's say I store um, a value of A to address 1000. What do you have in a store buffer then? Value A to be stored at address 1000. Right, but the processor wouldn't let you pick up this value because the processor knows the context where this comes from. So for functional correctness, the processor always have to, has to keep track of that. And uh, that means that you can't inject values into other processes. That's not true. So this is my high level microarchitectural inception idea. First, the attacker will plant a value A into a microarchitectural buffer from memory. And then a bit later, the victim executes and it will try to load a value B, completely different value, uh, and execute with that. However, when we do our little inception trick, um, the value A will be injected instead of, of B. And that's obviously bad. We can do all kinds of things like the transient buffer overflows, uh, control flow hijacking, you name it. And uh, an important last detail here, of course, is that the CPU is not completely wrong in the end. Uh, after we do our control flow or data flow redirection, uh, the CPU will detect the inception, the victim will wake up from its dream, and uh, there will be no traces left of this attack. Load value injection. Don't bother telling me it's impossible. It's perfectly possible. Just bloody difficult. That's what I keep saying to Daniel. Daniel is skeptical of every idea. Well, have you tried it before? We tried it. We got the processes into the transient state. We had everything, but they just didn't pick up the injected value. Was your transient window long enough? It's not just about the length of the transient window. You need a fault and you need the values exactly at the microarchitectural buffers where they can be picked up. It's a very subtle art. Yes, Michael, a subtle art for a state-of-the-art technology. We have this innovative new technology in Intel processors. It's called Software Guard Extensions, SGX in short, and it's being picked up by all major industry players, as you can see on this slide. And uh, what SGX essentially gives you is this hardware isolated encrypted memory region. It's called an enclave. And the very compelling aspect of that is that it's directly protected by the CPU. So that means with this state-of-the-art technology, we have control over the operating system. That's in the threat model. We can control page tables uh, and anything we want in the operating system. And I think we can use that to bring the victim into a dream, can't we, Michael? That's actually a really good idea. I mean, SGX protects you against direct remapping of pages, but there's still the paging unit involved. And if I do that, I get a page fault. So there's the fault I can actually get for that. Which means I can provoke arbitrary page faults inside this enclave and get any load to fault within the enclave. That's really cool. So for SGX enclaves, we can make a dream at any time that we want. That's exactly what we need for LVI, right? Uh, so let's see a very simple, what we call toy example. We have this green enclave on the right. And uh, 
the intended logic here is very clear. It's this yellow flow. You have a pointer and an index and an array and, and everything works beautifully well while you're awake. But if we bring that enclave into a dream using the paging trick that Michael just described, we can actually make it pick up our untrusted argument instead of the trusted index. And then we can make that point to an arbitrary secret and encode it through a cache cover channel uh, in the flush reload trick that we described earlier. So, so the, essen the essential thing here is that when the enclave starts dreaming, it diverts from its uh, trusted yellow path and it picks up that blue illegal value. We inject it uh, into the microarchitecture. Well done, you. Well done. That actually works. So if I do what you just told me, I can really see that in the cache, in the cache hits, and I see that I get the hit where the injected value was used and then the replay where the actual correct value was used. So it really picked up the injected value. Yes, that's micro-architectural inception, Michael. And it's in effect, this is not just one attack, it's an entire category of attacks. It's a completely new tree of attacks and, and we give full details of that in the paper, different ways to provoke faults and different ways to inject data uh, from different buffers. Uh, so we will just go into a few of those to give you an idea of what this is all about. Um, Yes, can, can you explain me? I mean, now you just injected a value and that leads to an access to an array location. Can you do something more powerful with that? Oh yes, you can do extremely powerful things similar to all these memory safety attacks we have seen over the last decades where we have arbitrary control flow hijacking in the victim domain. So, so let me explain how that works, Michael. You start by by doing the actual inception step, you need to plant the illegal value, the user controlled, um, attacker controlled pointer into one of those ar microarchitectural buffers. And that's simply by me doing uh, a pointer dereference, right? With some attacker value, uh, and it ends up in that buffer on the left. And the second step is when the victim performs a simple control flow redirection instruction, it can be as simple as a single x86 return instruction. Right? And, and here the idea is very, uh, very, very clear. It should return to the address uh, that is on the trusted stack. However, if we make the victim into that dream using the full trick uh, that we described earlier, we can, we can um, bring the LVI, the load value injection, into play and it will pick up the completely unrelated attacker control data that was in the microarchitectural buffer. And at that point, we succeeded actually in redirecting control flow inside the victim to an arbitrary location. And then we can do a sort of a return-oriented programming attack and start chaining together all kinds of gadgets. And, and essentially we have uh, sort of a Turing complete computation only limited by the length of our transient window. A nice theory. Do you have any proof that that actually works? Oh yes, we do. Let's, uh, let's look at a demo. So what you can see here is uh, a gadget inside an enclave and it does a store and a bit later uh, it does a return and here you can see the attacker code and we have our little trick here where we manipulate the page tables to bring the victim into the dream and when we run uh, the attack you can clearly see the enclave starts dreaming and it starts picking up that value r instead of uh, returning to the correct uh, address inside the enclave. So this is a very simple proof of concept but it shows a very powerful concept Namely, we can arbitrarily redirect execution inside the trusted enclave. And this is a very powerful primitive for, for all kind of uh, data leakage attacks built on top. All right, I I'm convinced by that. But still, you still need this construct in there, this gadget, that you can actually exploit for LVI. You need this storing somewhere and then loading it back. Can you find that somewhere in a real setting, not only in a dream setting? Yes, that's, that's a very good question, Michael. So we did quite some work there. We, dig, we, we were digging through a lot of code, but essentially what we found is that these gadgets are everywhere. And let me just give you a very simple example to show you we're really not talking about complicated code patterns. This here is an example where you have a single MOF, and it happens to be a MOF where we control the destination address, or at least some of the lower bits in the destination address. Uh, and a bit later, it's followed by a pop and a return. So this is this code is everywhere, right? It's a store. You you maybe um, write the um, result of the of the function call, and then you do a pop and a return. Um, and what happens here is that the return, which should load from the stack address, 
picks up the value from the completely unrelated address uh, that we just stored to. So this, this, this uh, essentially, these three lines of code allow you to do arbitrary um, control flow redirection in the victim enclave. And again, the cool thing is, this is a gadget that we found in the SDK, so it's automatically generated by some of the, of the code in the SDK, and it will be all over um, uh, real world enclaves. But wasn't that just a sample enclave that no one uses in reality? Well, uh, granted, but we also did a bit of an analysis on arguably the most single most important enclave in the SGX ecosystem. It's called the quoting enclave, and without going into details, it stores all these super secret long-term private uh, cryptographic keys from Intel. And if you get those, it's really game over for SGX. So we, we looked at that a bit and, and, and thought, can we find the ideal gadget there? And it turns out we can. So again, it's a very simple code pattern. It involves vector instructions. Uh, so it's a bit more complicated at first sight, but the important lines are the last two lines. So pop and a return. Uh, and again, it's very clear what that should do. It should follow the logic on the, on the control flow stack. But what happens is that it will pick up the values that we just stored a bit earlier uh, in that vector instruction. And again, this is a, a really cool gadget. We described that a bit more in the paper, but um, because of the, the, the code surrounding it, we actually control uh, the data as well as the store address uh, lower 12 bits. And that allows us to align perfectly with the return address on the stack and, and, and uh, set up a fake transient stack in the store buffer and arbitrarily hijack control flow in that very crucial enclave as well. Impressive. So I see you mastered the subtle art of injecting values into the microarchitecture. Instead of actual data values, it should be safe to just return zero values, right? Mm. I wouldn't do that if I were a CPU manufacturer. I believe an attacker could still abuse the incorrect zero values, and if you run into a transient execution, you could still mount an attack. We have noticed that the most recent so-called meltdown-resistant Intel processors actually forward the value zero to the faulting, uh, to the instructions following the faulting load. So they do not completely halt the transient speculative execution, but just continue with the value zero. And that's very interesting, right? Because it does stop all these kind of leakage-oriented meltdown attacks, but not so much for LVI. And, and to see why, imagine that you have an SGX enclave um, loading a trusted pointer and you override that with the value zero. Now, a crucial observation is that zero is a valid address. It's a valid virtual address and you can map an attacker control page there. And then what we do in the second stage, and you can see that here with the arrow, is to inject values from that attacker controlled zero address into the enclave. So it's actually a very capable, uh, powerful attack primitive. Um, imagine you have a, a function pointer to pointer, you hijack the first value of the pointer, overwrite that with zero, and then you inject arbitrary um, control flow addresses and, and, and yeah, you hijack the transient control flow in the enclave. Uh, we also have a cool attack to show um, transient fault injection on an ASNI uh, cryptographic algorithm. Uh, for full details of that, uh, also see the paper. Um, what you can see here uh, is something a bit more interesting. This is actually uh, an arbitrary um, stack hijacking gadget that we found in the Intel SDK. So this code is in every enclave. And what you can see is that it picks up, it loads the value of the stack pointer from memory. And if you overwrite that with zero, you will essentially set up what we call a transient stack at address zero uh, in the attacker controlled uh, memory outside of the enclave. Yo, what's the mitigation against LVI? Mm. Vendors might say that's none of our concern. Yeah, but this isn't the usual side channel leakage. We must understand the gravity of this attack. The value we plant in the microarchitecture can be picked up by any load in principle. It might come to change. It might come to change every program bi binary and have dramatic impact on their performance. We would have to change the program binary so that our injected load value is never forwarded to subsequent instructions. That's where our badge comes in. How about adding an L fence after every load instruction? Mm -hmm. Rumor has that L fences would stop transient execution. We can't work based only on rumor, can we? And even worse, adding L fences everywhere will have extremely negative impact on the performance. But if it's about security, we mustn't be afraid to add a few more L fences, darling. 
So as I suggested, we could use an elephant's instruction after every faulting load, because the elephant's instruction will transiently stop executing the execution of the CPU, and therefore you cannot inject the wrong value anymore. So we basically put a full stop in the execution. You cannot leak anything anymore and the world is safe again. This has been implemented by every major compiler you know, you like GCC, LLVM, the Microsoft compiler, and they have different options where you can fine tune this mitigation and it will inject an elephant's instruction after every load instruction that the compiler has emitted. Mm -hmm, Moritz, but it's it's actually even worse than only load instructions, right? So what about indirect branches? Those uh, instructions like call and return who who load a value from memory, the stack, and then immediately jump to it, right? That, that's even worse. There you have the full LVI pickup and redirection in one instruction. So uh, it turns out that all the compilers have to rewrite uh, the instruction stream so that there is not a single x86 red instruction anymore. And you can see the mitigation sequences here. It essentially has to emulate the return and put an elephant in between. And that's really, really bad, right? Uh, and in fact, we did a small analysis, Moritz, and uh, remember uh, back in October 2019, uh, we measured only 23 of those fences in uh, the Intel quoting enclave, very important enclave from Intel. Um, and that was only for Spectre, but after LVI patches, we have this, this what we call big hammer, and we have 50,000 fences. So that's really orders of magnitude difference. And I think we can expect what that will mean for performance, right, Moritz? So we will have elephants everywhere. And we actually implemented our own prototype mitigation of this mitigation and tested this with, for instance, the OpenSSL benchmarks. And as we can see, we have quite some overhead, up to 900% in some cases for AES CBC, for instance. In some other cases, if we just batch the red instructions, it's negligible and it's fine. And if we do the same thing with Intel's mitigations, then we come to closely to the same numbers of overhead. And it really depends on the use case on what you have to do, how the code is implemented, where it has to insert many, many elephants that basically stop the entire speculative execution and therefore makes everything so slow. And we also did that for the spec benchmark, which tries out different tools, for instance, here GCC, or video encoding or a compression algorithm. And also there, in some cases, the overhead is not that high in terms of the security it brings back to you. In other cases, the overhead is pretty, pretty high. So in the end, not everyone is going to use the full mitigation strategy. And as we can see, also covered by the news, when all the mitigations have been brought into place, they agreed and also rerun some benchmarks and show similar performance impacts when the mitigation is enabled. Okay, so to wrap up, we presented LVI, short for load value injection. Uh, and it's essentially a reverse meltdown type attack. It really shows that meltdown goes beyond just flushing buffers. Uh, and on the short term, it requires this very expensive and far going uh, Compiler mitigations that insert fences, at least for SGX enclaves. And on the longer term, uh, we think uh, this will be patched in silicon properly and with no, uh, not just uh, by blocking with a zero, but by blocking the whole transient flow. You can find more details on our research and uh, the full research paper as well on our website, lviattack.eu.